For our next content area, we're going to um, kind of spawn off of early Europe and um, we're going to begin our, our global voyage now. Um, and I think a good jumping off point is to kind of come off of that early Europe um, and we're, we're going to be a, near around the same time period. So when we ended in early Europe, we ended with that Baroque period. So that was really kind of like, you know, 1700s, um, late 17th uh, century. And we're kind of still in that era. Um, but now we're going to we're going to look abroad and we're going to focus on New Spain for this next lesson. So where is New Spain? What is New Spain? And basically what we have happening here is, um, you know, we have exploration and following the news of Christopher Columbus reaching the Bahamas in 1492. Um, that sparked a lot of um, European powers that were, you know, setting out explorers to basically go find new land. And um, their missions were to conquest and colonize. And um, the Spanish and the Portuguese were, of course, huge proponents in this. Um, and those adventurers occupied most of what we consider um, Latin America. So in this map, you can kind of see here, it's color coded um, in terms of, you know, which um, European um, explorers had come over to the New World to um, colonize. And we have, you know, the British, of course, up here in the Eastern, um, what is now United States. Um, we have some Dutch, um, some French as well, which is more, you know, towards Canada and Quebec and Montreal. Um, and so that's, you know, why they're still, um, you know, French speaking in that area of Canada. Um, but then you see yellow is a Spanish. So really so much of that um, southern central um, American land. And remember, you know, all of this land is not as we know it now. You know, it was not the United States, Canada, Mexico, um, South America. So it was, it was just, you know, this, this big, huge land full of various indigenous peoples. Um, but the Spanish had a huge, huge influence in that, um, South United States, Mesoamerican, and um, South American areas. So a little bit of historical information. Um, Native American Inca, Incas and Aztec cultures rapidly, rapidly fell once technological advances and disease-bearing Europeans invaded. It really did not take much. I mean, not only, of course, was there a lot of war and battle, but it was actually disease that took um, pretty much all of the Aztec cultures out. Um, bringing over smallpox and diseases like that, where um, indigenous peoples had never been exposed to, um, it, it just really wiped out civilizations. And that's part of why. Um, the Spanish were able to conquer so much is because um, their, you know, the, the, the indigenous people that they were in conflict with uh, were literally dying off. Um, so that's a big part of their uh, quote unquote victory. Um, locals definitely were enslaved to work for European overlords. Um, you had some natives that would marry into Spanish hierarchies and together they would produce children and these children are called um, mestizos. The Spanish uh, extracted tons of local natural resources from the New World such as golds and silver, um, you know, these kind of precious metals that were mined. Also the same with crops, such as corn and things like that. And then there became a lot of trade between the old world and the new world. 
it started to establish, of course, a worldwide trading empire, um, you know, that trekked across the Pacific Ocean now, connecting from Mexico to Asia. And um, this is going to be really evident and really important in the artwork because you're going to see a lot of that, that kind of trading influence in terms of um, materials. And you're going to even see a lot of that Asian influence happening in this kind of New World, New Spain area. The contact between East and West um, really enriched the artistic life in New Spain. And then back home in Spain, this was during a lot of the, you know, Napoleon Wars and instability rapidly grew um, and, and inspired uh, New Spain's colonies to seek independence. So all of the turmoil that was happening at home um, quickly expanded to what was happening in New Spain and quickly would seek independence from Spain. Um, and by 1822, most of Latin America actually was a patchwork of independent states. So the S Spanish colonization um, didn't last very long before it kind of dissipated and broke apart. The Spanish brought um, also Roman Catholicism to the New World. So Christianity was, was brought over, um, but specifically Roman Catholicism, um, a world of, of native and indigenous tribal spirituality was met with a religion that was rich in imagery and unlike the english colonists um, the spanish were not reluctant to use native artists to create a nice blend of artwork and so that's something that's very interesting is that um, in new spain you're going to see this um, interesting blend of artwork um, opposed to, you know, up in Northern America with the English colonies, um, there, there was no blending of the natives. Um, it really was about, you know, a, a true and a total takeover. Um, ultimately, the blend would consist of a combination of, you know, Roman Catholic um, icons with Native American traditions, and then you, you take that blend and then you add a little bit more from all of the trade that was happening between the East and the West. And like I said before, you're also going to see a lot of Asian influence, not just in materials such as ivory and silk and porcelain um, and, you know, some precious stones and things like that, but also imagery and um, style, style of painting as well. The English Protestants that settled in the current United States like I said, were of the contrary. They limited their artistic expression really only to very, very formal portraits, and they were also formal portraits of um, Europeans. Cusco, Peru <clears throat> was the first center of European art in the Americas. Spanish artists taught locals um, that Baroque style, because remember, we're right there in that period where the Baroque style in Europe um, became very prevalent, and so then that also um, kind of traveled over the Pacific into New Spain, and there they, there were actual, like, you know, artist colonies and artist schools that taught the Baroque style, um, but of, along with that style, also, you know, religious imagery, um, portraits, historical paintings, all of that kind of European influence, um, the Arcadian landscapes was also taught to those local um, native artists in New Spain. Um, big differences, though, that the um, New Spain paintings from New Spain definitely showed less interest in perspective. You're not going to see any kind of one point perspective or a lot of those um, paintings that have really clear um, depth. You're going to see very um, flattened uh, paintings with um, a lot of deep earth tones, and that comes a lot from just kind of that native look 
that was um, combined with some of these European styles. Um, but most artworks as that we're going to be looking at, um, most artworks in general, were anonymously created on purpose. And if you think about you know, what was happening with um, European art during this time, artists in Europe you know, were really established and were sought after and you know the name of the artist and who the artist was 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 a very important feature in the artwork um, and that really did not carry over um, in new spain artwork was anonymous because it was seen as like a service to the religion um, it really wasn't about you know fame or notoriety to the artist him him or herself so that's going to bring us to our first image for New Spain. It's number 81. It's called the frontispiece of the Codex Mendoza from 1542. And what we're looking at is pigment on ink paper. And this is part of a, um, of a book. This is um, kind of a, a recording um, that is, um, it records a history of both Aztec rulers and their conquests, as well as you know, a description of, of daily life um, for both pre-conquest Aztec society, but also post. So it's really a kind of a visual recording, this entire book that was put together to, and um, sent back to Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, almost as like a report, um, just as a means of showing, um, you know, people of power back in Europe what what life was like in the New World in New Spain. Um, it is named after Antonio de Mendoza who was a viceroy of New Spain. And so remember their jobs is to kind of be like a liaison, like a reporter um, between the old world and the new world. Um, it was created uh, about 20 years after the Spanish conquest. And it shows basically Aztec rulers and daily life in Mexico. And the this is where a lot of that Aztec influence comes in because they use pictograms and so all of these like little images that you see scattered around those are called pictograms um, instead of you know text or font um, and they were created actually by Aztec artists that then was later um, annotated in Spanish. So this is, you know, also showing another blending of um, these two cultures. This scene in particular depicts the founding of um, Tenochtitlan and the conquest of Cojulacan and Tenayuca. And the, um, that's here on the bottom. And these are all cities. And um, they have images, and I have a close-up on the other page, but they have images of um, enemy temples that are on fire, um, while Aztec warriors carry clubs and shields. And up at the top, there is an image of the Templo Mayor, um, which is, you know, like a big Aztec temple. And then um, we have skulls that represent you know sacrificed victims because that was a big part of the aztec culture um, in the center you have the eagle um, landing on the cactus and it's at this x which is you know the eagles in the center of the x which is the intersection of two waterways that commemorates the division of Tinto Chichlan into four um, quarters. Um, so it's it's very symbolic um, and very kind of you know tell telling of the culture and some of the uh, rituals as well. Here's a close-up of some of those pictograms. So there's the skulls that we talked about. Here's the eagle on a cactus, and then um, we have um, 
above the eagle is the the, um, the temple mayor um, and then you even can see on the outside you have a border of repeated uh, pictograms as well and this symbol here is still the current symbol um, on the Mexican flag um, so just to show you how long that this the symbol of this area has um, sustained. Um, the, in, the innovation that we're looking at here is basically, you know, that it's this combination of Aztec imagery, um, you know, with Spanish writing and, and that the function was, you know, as kind of a report to show people from the old world you know, how the new world was developing, what the cultures was like. Um, and the best way to do that is kind of through some of those native arts. Um, this is an image of the kind of entire book, just so you can get a better understanding um, of what this page in the book kind of looked like. Um, this next piece is image 90. It's called Angel with um, Archibus, and the artist was master of um, Calamarca. It's from 1680, oil on canvas. And hopefully both the time period and the medium oil being on canvas has brought you to you know, a direct con connection with that Baroque style, that style that you know, was um, taught to the natives, um, you know, formally um, from the from the old world. In terms of content, what we have here is an angel, and there's the wings, that's being depicted with an archivist, which is a rifle that was kind of you know created by the Spanish instead of a traditional sword. So that's um, that's a new innovation. That's a change of imagery. Again, it's kind of, um, you know, altering some icons to kind of fit these cultures. It's also an angel, but in a military pose that was very, very common in the 17th century, um, specifically to this area in Peru where we talked about that this is where a lot of that almost academic art training was taking place. It's probably, uh, they feel that this painting is probably one of a series of angels. There's like angel drummers and buglers and standard bearers and holders of swords. So it's kind of like angels that are in place of like these kind of um, military positions. Um, the drapery of a 17th century Spanish aristocrat very rich costuming. So all of this clothing and these textiles and this drapery is um, definitely um, is it definitely comes from the old world and that Spanish kind of aristocrat. So we know this is very formal and very expensive clothing. Um, you can definitely see, and that's what I love about this painting, because here we go, we go back and visit that mannerism. You can definitely see that mannerist influence in the proportions of this distorted figure. And I love that because you can tell that the flow of this figure, the movement of the figure and how it fits in the composition is way more important than the accuracy of the anatomy um, and the, the you know pin needle legs and the tiny shoes and then you look at the size of the hands and the fingers but then you know the largeness of the body um, so absolutely no proportions completely um, distorted and you definitely get that mannerist feel there is an inscription up at the top which is in Latin, and it translates to um, um, asyl, which is uh, fear of God. The angel appears almost in, in an androgynous state. So when we look at it, we're, we're not really getting a gender-specific you know, type of feeling, but 
that was also pretty true for a lot of like um, angels and cherubs in general. Um, they were pretty androgynous. You have gold embroidered on the fabric, which was, um, you know, definitely a, a favored of the indigenous people. The relationship between these images and the winged warriors of pre-Columbian pre art were very, very strong. Um, so again, we're, we're drawing a lot of parallels between these two cultures kind of merging and coming together to kind of create their own style. You can see that European influence, but you can also um, know that there's a lot of that, you know, pre-Columbian mysticism as well that's still included. These angels paintings in general, the series of this type of angels paintings were very popular and were, were created as a missionary push to enforce Catholicism. So this is, you know, kind, this kind of became a very common themed um, uh, subject matter for paintings. The Counter-Reformation in Europe, and later the Spanish Inquisition started an anti-angel um, in art movement that um, was not observed in the new world. So interestingly enough, you know, you had this counter-reformation going on where, um, you know, people were um, withholding from, you know, working with religious icons and working with um, figures in, in religion. But that was not happening in the new world. They did not experience that. So they got to continue to kind of divulge in that type of um, iconic portrayal. And they got to really kind of bring some of these uh, religious figures and icons to, to a new realm, to a new, um, into like a, a new development. Our next image is image number 94. It's a um, screen with the siege of Belgrade and hunting scenes. It's from um, 1697 to about 1701. And it's basically belongs to the circle of the Gonzalez family. It is tempera and resin on wood inlaid with mother of pearl. So the screen is made of wood. Resin is like a clear, um, heavy, thick coating that makes it look really, really, really shiny and, you know, almost has this kind of glassy effect to it. Um, and it's been painted with a temper paint and then mother of pearl was inlaid on it. And we have you know, learned about Mother of Pearl before, but it's, it's you know, kind of like little um, pieces of shell. So this was like a room divider screen, and it was co commissioned by Jose Sarmiento de Valadares, and you don't need to know that, but he was a viceroy of, of New Spain, and so you can kind of see that a lot of the patronage of of these elaborate artworks is kind of you know the same as as Europe and and also as Islamic art that they were um, commissioned by kind of the well off the wealthy um, you know the more you know aristocratic type of um, figures and it was displayed in a palace in New Mexico. What we are looking at here, what kind of makes this um, piece you know, interesting and offset from um, a lot of the artifacts that we have from New Spain is it's the only known example of an artwork that combines the Japanese folding screen um, with the shell inlay. And so this is, again, that kind of cross-cultural blending. So we have huge Asiatic influence here not just in the fact that this is a folding screen, which is, you know, uh, um, something that was used heavily in Japan, but also when we look closer at the paintings, you can, the painting styles also very, very Japanese as well. Um, and then we also have this inlay of this, this shell inlay. Um, so this is just, you know, one example that we have that combines kind of these two cultures. 
the, there's two sides to the screen. One is a hunting scene that's, you know, very Arcadian landscape. And then the other is a war scene. And the function for it was, you know, to be displayed in the home, like a very, um, a very, you know, talked about piece, a piece that was a feature piece in a room, but it had two functions. So if you were having a very kind of intimate, um, small, you know, gathering or reception of people, and it was more of like a, a small social event, then you would have the hunting scene displayed because that was suited for that type of an event. But if if there was a gathering of political forces or some sort of like important meeting, um, if it was kind of more about, um, you know, political work um, or government work, then you would have turned the screen to display the war side. Um, the war actually depicts a contemporary event, contemporary, you know, for this time period um, of the Great Turkish War of 1683 to about 1699, which led to victory for the Habsburg Empire. The reason why this war scene um, that led to victory for the Habsburg Empire is because um, it, it illustrates the Habsburg power and this family, this Habsburg family was um, the family that ruled Spain and the New World at one time. So there's a direct connection um, historically to that. Um, the materials and the size and everything of the screen, it was a very expensive screen to make. It was inspired by the lacquerware of Asian countries, which is about working with wood and then putting layers of that resin on it. So, um, you know, that's another Asiatic influence. Um, the paintings themselves are very, very delicate and thin paintings. They're um, more like a, a drawing than a painting, um, but I have some close-ups. So this side here is the hunting scene, really showing that like gorgeous Arcadian landscape, but at the same time, a lot of the, um, you know, trees and, and flora that you see in this landscape, it's not local. Um, and so that's just kind of another, you know, interest to the fact that they're not um, native local lands. And then these swags that you see up here at the top, um, that especially with the kind of centered lion faces where the swags kind of group and meet up. This is extremely Roman. Um, so th this is just a, a remarkable blend of cultural influences, both contemporary due to, you know, trading and East meets, meets West, but also it has homage to a lot of kind of that historical um, you know, classical art as well. So it's just this, this endless blend. And this is the opposite side here of that war scene. And again, you will see once we get into Asian art, there's so many similarities, especially the color palette. This like gray, black, white, and red, this like limited color palette. Um, that is very, very prominent um, in the entire painting. You're gonna see that happen a lot when we get into Japanese painting. Our next piece is number 95 by Miguel Gonzalez. It's titled The Virgin of Guadalupe from 1698. Um, we have oil on canvas on wood and it's inlaid with mother of pearl. Um, so we have um, basically a wooden panel, okay, with a canvas center, and then there is some oil painting going on here, but a lot of inlay as well, a lot of mosaic inlay. And my next slide has um, some close-up images, but just in terms of the meaning of this piece, the content, um, what we have here is a piece that kind of tells a fable, tells a story, and it's basically about 
Mary, when she appeared to Native Americans, um, to a group of Native Americans on a hill, um, and this hill used to um, be a shrine sacred to a pre-Columbian goddess, okay? And then Mary appeared at this spot and um, appeared in front of a group of Native Americans and, and ordered one of the Native American converts, Juan Diego, in 1531, ordered him to go tell the local archbishop to build a sanctuary on this site. So um, Juan Diego agreed, and Mary um, Mary had then had the power to make the hilltop just flower, just grow all these flowers. And Juan Diego picked um, the flowers and brought them to the archbishop to propose that you know he build a sanctuary on the site. And when he appeared in front of the archbishop, the cloth that Juan Diego was was wearing revealed the image of the Virgin. And so that's kind of the fable behind um, this piece and what what it's kind of depicting is that story. Um, that story also shows a lot of, if you know anything at all about kind of Mexican, um, you know, um, Catholic, Mexican Catholicism, and their affection towards Mary and the, the Virgin Guadalupe, that it's also very, very common, very prevalent in their religion to, for images of Mary to appear in, you know, different areas of life. Um, not, it's not a Jesus thing, really, for Mexican Catholics, but it really is a Guadalupe um, Thing. And so this this kind of you know talk talks a little bit about that history of Mary appearing in you know everyday um, objects in, in everyday life. Um, the Virgin of Guadalupe really is the most revered symbol in Mexico. She's the um, the patroness of New Spain, and another uh, symbol of Mexico that is also included in this painting is again the um, the eagle on a cactus. It's at the bottom center right below Mary. So we have that um, symbol and that iconic imagery um, repeating itself. In Guadalupe images, Mary always stands on a crescent moon. It's hard to see here, but she always stands on a crescent moon. And then again, um, specific to the Virgin Guadalupe, she will always be oops, surrounded by an aura of sun rays, okay, and um, and clouds behind her. And in Revelations 12, 1, it says, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. So, from that is where you get the um, repeated imagery of the Virgin Guadalupe, and here is her crown on top as well. Um, she is surrounded by four kind of circles in the four corners, which is depicting the apparition um, to Juan Diego at the moment that the Virgin's image is revealed in his robing, in his tunic. So those corner um, bubbles is the, the story, the fable of um, Juan Diego and um, kind of asking that a sanctuary be built. Here are some close-ups because it's also important to understand what is oil painting and what is the mother of pearl mosaic. And when you look closer, um, there is not much that is painted really there's a there's a, a huge amount of mother of pearl so when we look at virgin guadalupe really her entire robing is all mother of pearl uh, inlaid mosaic but you know her face and her hands is oil painted 
um, if you look in these corners as well, you have a lot of mother of pearl inlay, even in their clothing, you still have that mother of pearl, but you have tiny faces that are oil painted and some of the background, okay? Um, you have your angels and your cherubs that uh, are mainly uh, oil painted with, you know, some mother of, of pearl kind of scattered about, but really, it's it's very heavily mosaic. Um, I think more so than a, it would be considered a painting in my book. Um, the brocade of the Virgin's robe is made by the um, Anconchados. The uh, Anconchados, which was an influence of the Asian decorative arts. So again, we have that that trade factor coming in here. We're we're using materials that aren't native. But because of that, you know, they're import and they're seen as, as very, very precious. Um, this image became in high demand. Um, many, 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 many images of the Virgin Guadalupe were reproduced. Um, not necessarily, you know, this style of, um, you know, mosaic and inlay, but just this image of the Guadalupe and was made for export all around New Spain. Um, again, I think the theme of this whole content area about innovation is just the merging of cultures. Um, the obvious cultures being, of course, European and Latin, but then just also the influence of all those cultures involved with trade. Our next one is image 97. It's attributed to the artist Juan Rodriguez, so that means that we may not have a complete, you know, um, definitive understanding that this is artist Juan Rodriguez, but knowing other artworks of him, of his, we are attributing this one to him as well. Um, it's titled Spaniard and Indian Produce a Mestizo from 1715 Oil on Canvas. And what this is, is this is a, a panel from, um, a series of what's called Costa paintings. And they may not have been a completed set. Um, it may have been incomplete or it may not have actually been a set at all, but maybe just a series of paintings. But what is depicting here is the Spanish social hierarchy um, with the European ancestry at the top. So. And, and this this is like literally, you know, outlined in their civilization that there were 16 different gradations or levels of social scale, and they were all kind of titled and outlined, and and that title was um, listed at the top. Okay. Um, what this is also showing is that you have Spanish blood um, linked to um, civilizing forces that are wearing, you know, lavish costumes and, um, you know, very, very kind of importantly featured, um, you know, Spanish Europeans that um, have come but have harmoniously conquered, right, the the natives and the Indians and the um, indigenous peoples. And that's a lot of, of what, what was about New Spain, was really projecting this kind of like harmonious conquering, this harmonious blend of old world and new world. And a lot of their art was, you know, trying to kind of display this um, to the old world. And so a lot of these paintings and things that we're seeing here were used to kind of show off to the old world that, you know, we, we have been very successful here and everybody's living in harmony and, you know, everybody is kind of getting along. And, you know, when historically we know that is not necessarily accurate. Um, we have the the natives that are rendered with you know much respect they're they're 
clothed beautifully. Um, there's, you know, they look like they're kind of equal partners, but at the same time, oddly enough, the, their facial features, even though they have that kind of darker, browner skin, they still have facial features of the Europeans. They have very narrow nose and almond-shaped eyes, um, but, you know, it's like, you know, just European features, but with a little bit darker skin. Um, we have um, Spanish colonists would commission um, that these works be sent abroad to show how the caste system of the New World was working. It was not necessarily considered art objects, but more so illustrations of ethnic groups to sell to the New World. So they were almost like kind of like, I don't know, like posters per se, like advertisements, for lack of a better word. Um, and just kind of like one of those things where if you see it, then we're all going to believe it and buy into it. Um, but but the title then shows that, you know, this is, this is a couple and their children because they're kind of mixed. Um, they're called the mestizo. And then our last image, number 99, this is a portrait image of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, and it was by artist Miguel Cabrera from 1750. We're looking at an oil on canvas. So Sor Juana Inés, which translates to Sister Juana Agnes, um, this, this painting is really interesting because I, honestly, it, I feel like it's one of our earliest um, kind of feminist paintings, but she was a child prodigy who chose to be a nun rather than marriage um, so that she could then kind of buy the freedom to pursue um, her intellectual passions. Um, if she did not become a nun and became married, you know, she would she would not be able to do that. She would have to give that up to, you know, live the life of housewife and mother. Um, but she was so um, intelligent and, and intellectually gifted that she wanted to nurture that. So she chose going into the nunnery um, and she was born a Creole woman um, and was said to uh, be one of the first feminists of the Americas. Um, she lived in a Mexican convent that served her um, a, a very privileged life with comfort and servants. Um, and she was in her time, in her, um, in her living time, she was a literary figure. She had published many, many books that were widely read she wrote poetry and theatrical pieces. So like I said, she was really um, quite an intellect. Um, she maintained a fabulous library, which is the environment um, and the setting for her portrait. Um, and she's also surrounded by um, extreme symbols of her faith. She is historically and instrumentally known for giving girls an education um, in a very, very male dominated world. Um, and this painting, interestingly enough, was actually painted 55 years after her actual death um, as a way to pay homage um, for her admirers. So what that means was she did not pose for this portrait, okay? This was painted long after her death. Um, it's a typical nun portrait because she's wearing her her habit and um, her her nun's badge, which is this humongous thing that looks like it would annoy the heck out of me. It's just humongous, but that is her nun's badge. And in her left hand, right here, she has her long rosary. Um, and then in the other hand, um, on her table. She is her uh, book of St. Jerome. Um, now, it's different from a typical nun's portrait because of her view. She is looking directly 
and assertively and confidently at the viewer. And that was not typical for a nun's portrait. Usually she would be kind of, you know, looking upward, you know, towards the heavens or looking outward, um, you know, with kind of like a slight, you know, turning of the head, slight like profile view, but not this one. She is staring directly at you, the viewer. Um, she's also sitting at a desk that is surrounded by instruments of learning. Um, so that's that's the other thing that's not typical of a nun portrait. I mean, she has a lot of the traditional features of a nun portrait that we went over, but then she's included also those non-traditional things. So she has um, instruments of learning. She has her library, which if you are able to look closely at the books, a lot of them reveal that they're books of philosophy, of science, mythology, and history. And if you think about that alone, philosophy, science, mythology, and history, that alone paired with such um, an important religious figure being a nun, that right there is such a dichotomy in and among itself that it makes it very um, kind of non-traditional. Um, her religious life is juxtaposed to her intellectual life, which in theory, you know, can often conflict with one another, but she really was a very, very um, unique person. And like I said, if you um, read about her historically, um, you learn that she probably could be um, titled one of the earliest or first feminists of um, the Americas. So that ends our um, content of New Spain. Hopefully you enjoyed these images and that you were able to see a lot of the connections from Europe, um, but hopefully you also were able to take in all of this kind of blending of cultures, cross-cultural, um, influences that were happening and, and that's really what makes this small time period of art um, very unique and very different.